A new study shows the political system is bypassing the poor. Big money gets big givers, a reward most Americans could never afford. This is an almost universal sense that something is deeply wrong in American democracy. America's working class and poor communities find themselves locked out of the political process. Without resources to fund candidates and shape issues, how can they gain a meaningful voice? One answer may be a concept called community organizing, pioneered by a man named Saul Alinsky over 50 years ago. It becomes a contest of power. Those who have money and those who have people. We have nothing but people. Our power is rooted in our being organized people, and we are astute enough to know what our own destiny is and to go for it. Coming up next, the democratic promise, Saul Alinsky and his legacy. Major funding for the Democratic Promise was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the following underwriters. The mission is to remember those that didn't get homes when we get our homes to continue in the struggle. That's where we came from. We came from the struggle. Power concedes nothing without demand, wrote Frederick Douglass, the famed abolitionist. This is the story of ordinary people making demands for the power to improve their communities and govern their lives. Are you ready for the resurrection of your community? That's what John Dewey called the democracy is a way of life. That's the way of life, participating in public action. This type of public action is rooted in the philosophy of Saul Alinsky, who championed new ways of organizing the poor and the powerless that created a backyard revolution in cities across America. His work influenced the struggle for civil rights, the farm workers movement, and even the very nature of political protest. In 1970, Time magazine hailed Alinsky as a prophet of power to the people and argued that Alinsky's ideas had forever changed the way American democracy worked. Yet those who clashed with Alinsky attacked him as an agitator, a hate monger, and a troublemaker. Some called him a communist, others a dupe of the Catholic Church. Somebody who goes off in a monastery and starts praying for the salvation of mankind and doesn't do a damn thing but sits there and prays I think that when that guy comes up for judgment, that the judge is going to sit there and say, why, you cruddy bastard. Above all, Saul Alinsky passionately believed that social justice can be achieved through American democracy, but he had no illusions on how to obtain it. I tell people the hell with charity, he once said. The only thing you'll get is what you're strong enough to get. Saul Alinsky's hard-nosed politics emerged from the rough-and-tumble world of Chicago in the late 1930s. The city was controlled by the Kelly Nash political machine and by Frank Nitti, heir to Al Capone's empire. While the nation was mired in the Great Depression, Alinsky completed a graduate degree in criminology at the University of Chicago. But his real education came from his work on the streets. He ingratiated himself with members of Al Capone's gang to study gang behavior from the inside. Through this work, Alinsky and his colleagues were among the first to view criminal behavior as a symptom of poverty and powerlessness. Saul was a very unusual young man, and he winds up involved with a lot of, of youth committees. He actually works down in Joliet Prison, and he eventually is working for Clifford Shaw at the Institute for Juvenile Research. And Shaw's the one who assigns him to this neighborhood. This neighborhood was the back of the yards, an immense slum sitting in the shadow of Chicago's giant Union Stockyards complex, the setting of Upton Sinclair's landmark novel, The Jungle. Shaw assigned Alinsky to work the streets to learn the causes of juvenile delinquency. 
This was one of the great industrial working class neighborhoods of the world. You had one of the largest uh, factory complexes that humanity had ever created. The people working there were poor. You had this being the site of a very dynamic union drive. So if you were someone who wanted to deal with social problems, that was a very exciting place to go down to. Wages were cut three times in one year. And with no security, there was a tremendous desire for something to give a decent life, a standard of living, and respect uh, to the people in the packing industry. Saul came around, and he told me that what he was interested in is seeing whether an organization could be formed of all sectors of the community, so that the community should, by its own action, as a practice of democracy, work out their own destiny. In other words, if you ever have an undue concentration of power in one sector of our society, an undue concentration of wealth in, in one sector of our society, the whole democratic system will collapse internally. Alinsky was convinced that poverty, unaddressed, left America open to the influence of right-wing demagogues. He saw participation in the political process as the key to preserving democracy. In back of the yards, Alinsky envisioned an organization of organizations comprised of neighborhood groups, small businesses, labor unions, and most influential of all, the Catholic Church. This was a neighborhood that was intensely, intensely organized through the churches, through what was known as social athletic clubs. These people had a, a very strong sense of organization that they felt very comfortable with. And the insight of Saul and Joe was, Use it. Don't discard that. Joe was Joe Meegan, an Irish-American youth organizer with strong ties to the Catholic Church. He arranged a crucial meeting with Bishop Bernard Scheel, one of the few Catholic leaders in Chicago willing to work with labor unions. It would have been impossible to organize Packing House the way it was done without having Catholic Church support. And Alinsky was able not only to bring those churches together, with one another and along with a lot of other organizations in that community, but then to get them into a relationship with this union, which they viewed as communist. And with the idea of seeing whether we, the union, and the church, and the businessmen could forge an alliance, I was all sold for it. I told Saul, I said, Saul, uh, you may be a pretty smooth guy, but I don't know whether you're going to be able to, to get me and these priests in the same room. But Alinsky understood the nature of self-interest and its uses in bringing disparate groups together. With Megan, he organized the churches, the union, and over 100 existing organizations to create the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council. The first meeting of the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council was revolutionary in American history because it showed us the way to organize communities. Our union and the community became one and the same thing when it came to action on things that were needed. And this was at a time when the union was really building up tremendous strength and preparing to go after winning bargaining rights in one plant after another. As the union prepared for a national strike, the Back of the Yards Council meeting demonstrated the depth of community support for its cause. Just days after the first council meeting, the union held a massive labor rally. Alinsky and Megan worked behind the scenes to set up an unprecedented joint appearance by Bishop Bernard Shield and powerful labor leader John L. Lewis, one of the founders of the Congress of Industrial Organizations. 